Hi, this is Carlet Sanders and today I'm going to talk about collective management and collection management organizations for indie musicians. Poor or incorrect registration of works and performances with CMOs or no registration at all have resulted in millions of dollars of income going to the wrong person for business or people not being paid at all. The music industry is awash with money which ends up being returned to phonogram producers or publishers because for some reason it cannot be paid through to the correct author or performer. A good artist manager will focus particular attention on collective management and will do everything possible to ensure that the artist is receiving all the income due. What exactly is collective management and why is it necessary? What's the history behind it? As we discussed in the copyright chapter, the legislation of rights for authors was the first to be established. The first attempt at collective management was the establishment of the Bureau de Legislation. This organization is still functional today with a different name. The first CMO, as we now know, was established in the mid-19th century again in France. This was the first real CMO for music authors and came about as a direct result of a court decision when two composers, together with a lyricist, sued a cafe for playing their works without paying them. By the mid-19th century, this was becoming impractical as it was impossible for an author to know when and where one of their works was being performed. By the early 20th century, similar societies often referred to as performing rights societies were formed in most European countries and some other countries around the world. In 1926, the delegates from 18 such societies got together and formed an umbrella organization under the name of the Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers, which today continues to play a major role in the collective management of authors' and publishers' rights. The situation for performers before the introduction of the gramophone and radio was quite straightforward. The performer would perform live if the conditions for a performance were agreeable. If the conditions were not acceptable, then the performer simply refused to perform. The performer had complete control over their rights, which was the human right to perform or not. When the first recordings or fixed performances came along, the whole landscape changed. It again became impractical for a performer to give permission every time someone wished to play a recording in public. I'm going to talk more about this subject in my next post.